Hi, I'm Kristen Goodwin. On this episode of the Fox News Rundown, the Supreme Court reviews challenges to the Biden administration's emergency COVID-19 vaccine regulations for private employers and health care centers. Fox News at Night anchor and chief legal correspondent Shannon Bream breaks down the legal arguments for both sides of the issue. And while COVID-19 cases continue to rise across the nation, Johns Hopkins senior scholar Dr. Amesha Dalja joins the rundown to explain how the rapid spread of the Omicron variant and vaccines preventing serious illness is good news in America's ongoing fight against the virus. Plus commentary by Fox News senior meteorologist Janice Dean. The Fox News Rundown is a daily news podcast where we take a deeper look at the stories important to you. You could subscribe on your favorite podcast player by going to foxnewspodcast.com. I'm Shannon Bream. I'm Bill Hemmer. I'm Kennedy, and this is the Fox News Rundown. Friday, January 7th, 2022. I'm Chris Foster. The Supreme Court takes up President Biden's coronavirus vaccine mandates today. You could definitely put together five justices who would say, listen, we're in a unique time in history. The federal government is doing everything that it can. And in their assessment, their judgment, they think this will lessen cases and severity of illness and death. And, you know, they've got a right to do it. We speak with Fox News host and chief legal correspondent Shannon Bream. I'm Alex Hogan. Kids ages 12 to 15 join those eligible for the booster. But as new variants emerge in the future, how often will we need these extra jabs? It comes back to what the goals may be with COVID-19 control. Are we trying to prevent serious illness, hospitalization and death? Or are we trying to block all infections? And I'm Janice Dean. I've got the final word on the Fox News Rundown. The Supreme Court's hearing challenges to Biden administration coronavirus vaccine mandates that would cover about 100 million Americans. One mandate covers employees of large businesses. That comes from the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA. That was supposed to go into effect this week, but it's been pushed back because of the lawsuits. White House spokeswoman Jen Psaki says a lot of companies are just doing it on their own. Almost two thirds of companies have taken steps to put in place uh, either either vaccination requirements or testing requirements. They're all implementing it in a different way. And the leadership of these companies is making a decision about what works best for their workforce. Giving that option is something certainly we support. Another mandate covering health care workers comes from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Louisiana Attorney General Jeff Landry led a lawsuit joined by 13 other states asking the courts to block that. He tells Fox. States and individuals are sovereign. We should not be able, we should not have the government forcing us Mm. to do anything. Both mandates were announced in November. The first one deals with companies that have more than 100 employees. So what happens here is OSHA, which essentially regulates health and safety in the workplace, has put out an emergency authorization saying, if you have that many employees or more, you've got to either require them to get vaccinated or require them to wear masks and test for COVID at least once a week. Shannon Breams, the Fox News chief legal correspondent and the host of Fox News at Night. So the other mandate dealing with healthcare workers has to do with uh, those who would work in a facility that receives receives Medicare or Medicaid funding, and those can be privately run or publicly run. If any of that money flows to those facilities, the people who work there, employees, volunteers, contractors at any of those facilities, this promulgation or this regulation that was promulgated would say they've got to be vaccinated. And so that's pretty much everybody, uh, every at least decent sized uh, healthcare facility takes those. Now, uh, Mm -hmm. who brought the challenges to both? Well, you had a number. I mean, with with the OSHA challenge in the very beginning, uh, it came from companies and businesses, I mean, immediately filed in every one of the lower circuits that are the feeder courts into the Supreme Court. So you've got all kinds of different agencies, states that have gotten involved, um, all kinds of plaintiffs are involved there. Uh, The case is titled the National Federation of Independent Business uh, versus the Department of Labor. So they're kind of the spearheading group that's gotten this case all the way to the Supreme Court. In the other case, you have uh, states that are essentially uh, the ones who brought the case involving the healthcare workers. These states, many of them do run state run um, hospital entities or healthcare facilities. So they're suing as states saying, you can't tell us we can't have federal money unless we do this vaccine mandate for all those workers or employees or contractors at these facilities. So, so far, the lower courts have been more or less against the mandates, right? I don't think they're completely winless, the Biden administration. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely been a mix. What happened with the OSHA mandate, if you remember, that immediately the first uh, circuit court to hear it was the Fifth Circuit, and they actually uh, ruled to put the thing on hold. 
Well, what happened was when there is multi-jurisdiction legislation like this, and there was a case on this filed in every single one of the lower circuits, there's a lottery so that all of the uh, the litigation can be put together in one place. That lottery then was assigned to a different circuit court, the Sixth Circuit, which actually said, no, we're not going to ban the OSHA uh, mandate for now. So you've got a split in the circuits, but it's a technical distinction right now because technically the Sixth Circuit is overseeing everything. So essentially it's enough that uh, there were enough justices who said, we got to get involved. Yeah. So what's the method here by which the court took this up? It's an emergency case sort of acceptance situation, right? Will there be a sped up, uh, a sped up timeline for a decision as well? I think so. I think we can expect that. We've seen a couple of these. They're very unusual for the court to do this where, you know, it normally takes months or even years for these cases to get to the court, cases to get to the court. But in this um, situation, in this scenario, it's been a matter of weeks. So it is super expedited. The court decided, listen, these are urgent case questions that got to be answered right now. There are people who are having to decide um, and employers to decide, do we spend the money to go ahead and implement uh, these mandates? Uh, Employees deciding, do I go ahead and take the vaccine or do I risk my job? So uh, the court has definitely sped this up uh, at rocket speed for the way that they normally operate. So they'll hear the cases uh, today on Friday, both of these cases, um, and we could have a decision within days. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is This isn't the end of it, right? The court is basically deciding whether to let the mandates be enforced while these challenges play mm-hmm. out. So the, the, they aren't decisions on the mandates themselves, or could mm-hmm. they end up doing that down the road, or have I, have I misread this? No, you're exactly right. And that's a distinction that's good for people to understand that, yes, this is strictly about whether or not these uh, vaccine mandates can be stayed for now while they plan on the merits. But what, you know, most people think is like, listen, if the Supreme Court goes through this whole process and um, strikes down either of these um, regulations or these mandates, you have to wonder how open they're going to be to upholding them if they show back up here in a year, because really, if they go through the lower courts and come back, it would probably take several months to a year or more to get them back. So a lot of people think, all right, listen, if the Biden administration loses these mandates at the federal level, they may say, okay, especially if it looks like we're through the worst of Omicron within the next couple of weeks, if they get a loss on either of these from the Supreme Court, they may say, we're not going to relitigate it because once it gets back to the court, we're likely to get the same decision. Or if they lose on either of these, they may say, we're going to keep fighting. We think it's important. This thing is not over. Every time we thought it's over, there's another wave. So we're going to stick with it. Are there specific precedents the court can look to, or is this just another case about presidential versus congressional versus the state's authority to get things done? Yeah, I do think it's going to be more wonky. I think it's going to be looking at agency law, whether these agencies, OSHA and HHS, whether those uh, federal agencies that are part of the executive branch, whether they have the power to do what they've done in these situations. Um, Obviously, the plaintiffs argue it's an overreach. These were emergency authorizations that didn't go through the normal vetting process, which there is a formula for doing these emergency uh, regulations, but they're going to argue um, that it's a, just a broad overreach to tell every employer in the country, essentially over a hundred employees that you have to do what the federal government just months ago admitted it could not do. I mean, OSHA does have this emergency authority. It has something to, uh, the term grave danger is used. They're allowed to step in and, and, uh, and put these regulations in place if there's grave danger. Mm-hmm. One of the part of the problem is that there's, that's not defined really by anybody. Um, mm-hmm. So there are mixed results. Uh, in court in the 70s and 80s when they were you know looking at things like benzene and pesticides and asbestos and they mostly lost in courts then Mm -hmm. yeah and so what the language says you know if osha is going to do this emergency um, regulation it's an emergency temporary standard is what it's called Um, they have to show that employees are exposed to grave danger from exposure to substances or agents determined to be toxic or physically harmful or from new hazards and that the emergency standard is quote necessary to protect employees from such danger so obviously they're what they're arguing is the top toxic substance would be having people in the workplace who weren't vaccinated who could possibly um, be carrying the virus uh, and infect other people you know you're going to hear the argument now we all know vaccinated people and boosted people who have and are spreading um you know coronavirus the cdc the fda the nih like everybody admits that's actually what's happening now so I think that's going to that's going to be a tough part of the argument for the government here. Uh, If their argument is we want to keep unvaccinated people out of the workplace because they're the ones who would spread it when now all of those agencies uh, and the Biden administration admit that vaccinated people are getting and spreading it. I think it it makes the argument for the government a little tougher. Yeah, it's funny, the timing of things and how the science of things changes. Like the fact that now we know that vaccinated people, even if they're not getting as sick in general, and if they're not as infectious, there are lots and lots and lots of breakthrough cases. So. You're right. If we didn't know that, that things might be different. 
Yeah, I mean, we've certainly progressed a long ways. These two uh, regulations from OSHA and from HHS that are going to be argued at the Supreme Court today came out in November. And as with everything with this virus, we learn something new every day, every week. We have new data. We have new numbers. And the situation has changed significantly since November when it seemed like for most people, the vaccines were holding, um, boosters were rolling out, uh, people felt pretty good. Now, whether it's just Omicron that has been able to escape the vaccines and has been much tougher for people, it's created a different situation where, again, you know, the admission is that vaccinated people are getting and spreading it. So when these mandates came out, that wasn't something that we knew. And now that's a different a ball field for the Supreme Court to be playing on when they just uh, have to now rubber meets the road on whether these mandates are going to be able to stand. The people in favor of these mandates, or at least arguing that they're okay, point to, well, if you want to go to college, you've got to get vaccinated. If you want to be in the military, you've got to get vaccinated. I mean, and the Supreme Court have said uh, also that the, that the college mandates are fine. And they've said that Maine and New York, in this case, can have their own vaccine requirements for healthcare workers. Um, I guess I mentioned this before. Is this something where they say, look, public health decisions aren't made by a presidential administration? Mm -hmm. I think that the court, I think it does make a difference that we're talking about federal regulations that the court is dealing with, because um, I, I think there's an argument for a lot of folks that that these health decisions are left to localities and states. And when the federal government gets involved and makes a sweeping nationwide promulgation, I think it's harder for the federal government to defend that than it would be, say, for a local or state uh, agency or entity where they are closer to and have more power when it comes to regulating public health. So I think the fact that these are federal makes them a little bit more vulnerable uh, to arguments that they're inappropriate. Um, but I, you know, I also think you know, you could definitely put together five justices who would say, listen, we're in a unique time in history. The federal government is doing everything that it can. And uh, in their assessment, their judgment, they think this will lessen cases and severity of illness and death. And, um, you know, they've got a right to do it. So we'll see. I mean, I, I think that it's going to be a close call. And the hope that you alluded to is that all of this could be moot. Um, if, if, it, if it drags out and drags out and drags out, it might not be as relevant to public health if COVID is less of a problem. I guess it, though, could set a uh, precedent for future decisions, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the next time something like this happens, if it happens. Yeah. And I think we all have to, you know, assume that it will at some point, hopefully not in our lifetimes. I think we all think one is enough for us for this generation. But um, but we have to be realistic. And the court is always thinking multi chess steps ahead of where the game is right now, because they know whatever they write, whatever they decide will be depended on for decades, for centuries, potentially. I mean, you set a precedent and it's extremely important. So I think they're not just looking at the immediate situation that we're in. They are most certainly thinking about how whatever they decide affects jurisprudence as the highest court in the land for generations to come. So while some of us may be a little myopic based on whatever our personal experience is with the mandates or with the virus or with our families or with our jobs, they're definitely going to be thinking multiple steps ahead uh, as they decide what they do in this case, in these two cases, uh, knowing that it will impact things uh, for the history of our country. Uh, when do you expect that we'll hear whether these band-aids could be enforced for now? It's tough to figure that out. We know that they did because these expedited cases are so rare. They did the Texas abortion case. They heard that. And within a couple of weeks, we had a decision. Um, that was something they did expedited late last year. So I would imagine knowing everything that's at stake and the deadlines that are coming, I would say within a couple of weeks is reasonable. Okay. Uh, Just Shannon Bream. Okay. I'll take it better than I've got. Uh, Shannon Bream, anchor Fox News at night, uh, midnights Eastern, nine uh, in the West weeknights on Fox News Channel. Also, she's a Fox News chief legal correspondent relevant to our discussion today. And uh, she's got a podcast too, Live in the Bream, my favorite podcast title of the entire family of podcasts we have here. <laughs> uh, Shannon, thanks for coming on The Rundown. Thank you, Chris. This is Janice Dean with your Fox News commentary coming up. Omicron is spreading like wildfire, and there's a lot of confusion about the current isolation and travel guidelines depending on where you are. But there is some hopeful news. Thursday, the WHO announced the number of weekly worldwide COVID deaths dropped. Still, the case numbers are climbing up 71 percent globally. Chief Medical Advisor to the Biden administration, Dr. Anthony Fauci, at Wednesday's White House COVID-19 briefing emphasized. 
without a doubt, unequivocally, we are dealing with a highly, highly transmissible variant that spreads rapidly. The data are overwhelming in that regard. During previous waves, the spikes usually translated to a higher death toll about two weeks later. But the symptoms with Omicron are typically much milder, at least for the vaccinated. Domestically, the effort to strengthen kids' immunity is ramping up as Omicron fuels countless school closures across the country. White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator Jeffrey Zeitz acknowledged concerns by saying, Parents want schools open. And experts are clear that in-person learning is best for kids' physical and mental health and for their education. And the president couldn't be clearer. Schools in this country should remain open. Children ages 12 to 15 can get their booster, as can kids as young as five years old with immune deficiencies. So what does that mean for schools? And can they get back on track in the near future? I think that there's been and the ability to have a safe return to schools, even in the pre-vaccine era, because we know that schools are not major centers of transmission, at least not the educational component of schools. Extracurricular activities are a little bit different. That's Dr. Amish Adalja, infectious disease specialist at John Hopkins University. And we've got best practices to keep kids in school, to keep in-person learning going. And these types of practices were derived in an era when the pandemic was raging outside the school doors, but the schools are relatively safe. And I think it really is something that has to be prioritized. And it becomes even easier when you have teachers vaccinated, staff vaccinated, children vaccinated, and high-risk individuals able to be boosted. It really it should not be the default anymore to have schools going to virtual. It, it really has to be seen as a failure when that occurs, and it has to be avoided at, at all costs. And schools should be the very, very last thing to close and the very, very first thing to open. And I do think we are seeing a lot of schools close just as they opened up after the new year and the holiday break for kids across the country. What do you say to parents who are simply too afraid to send their kids back to class right now? Children generally tend to be spared from the severe consequences of disease. And the best way to protect your child from any chance of infection is to get them vaccinated. And we know that children in the United States are one of the lowest vaccinated groups. Uh, parents should also ask that their schools have their teachers be required to be vaccinated. I think as a condition of employment, that also makes schools safe. But we, you have to keep also in mind that schools have been through this and have survived with minimal disruption when they actually put in place the best practices to keep COVID-19 from interrupting school. And I think that that's what people should be reassured about. That there is a method to do this that's been shown to be safe. And we know that keeping children outside of school actually damages them. And you have to think, not just about the COVID-related well-being of a child, but the overall well-being of a child. And in-person schooling yeah. is something that adds to the overall well-being of, of children. And I think parents, ex with the exception of some who may have high-risk children that are immunocompromised who had a transplant, that's a little bit different. But for most, the vast majority of children without any medical problems, I think school is one of the safest places they can be. Yeah, and we've seen just the devastating mental toll that this has taken on really the, this generation of kids in school who've missed out on some of those formative years of learning and social activity. And throughout the pan pandemic, we have seen that the cases among children have been much lower, as you alluded to. But with this new variant, Omicron, is it affecting kids any differently? Omicron is going to basically infect everyone, and it has an easier time infecting people who are not fully vaccinated and hospitalizing people who are not fully vaccinated. And as I said earlier, children tend to have the lowest vaccination rates in this country of any age group. So Omicron is going to infect them. Uh, as cases go up, children are going to get infected, especially as children, because they're spared from severe consequences of disease, are back to a lot of their activities with sports and extracurricular activities. But there's no evidence that this is more severe in children uh, than any other variant may have been. We are seeing some hospitalizations increase, but that's to be expected as cases increase. A, a, a proportion of them are going to result in hospitalization, primarily in those children with underlying conditions. But we're also seeing hospitals being really aggressive at testing everybody that's admitted to make sure that they capture all the COVID-19 cases. So there are some hospitals reporting that children are testing positive incidentally when they come in for other reasons. But, but in general, I think it still remains true that children are spared severe consequences of disease. Yes, there ha are children that get severe illness. They tend to be those that have some risk factor for disease. And, and the vaccine makes this a lot, uh, a lot easier to navigate for parents.
And each variant, we've seen a triggering of different symptoms. So what are the main symptoms that we're seeing for Omicron right now? Omicron seems to be more mild in the sense that it's causing a lot more upper respiratory symptoms rather than lower respiratory symptoms. So more of the congestion, scratchy, sore throats, uh, those types of cold symptoms that, that we are all so used to having, and less of the uh, loss of taste and smell, which had really been very specific for COVID-19. So it, it does have a little bit of a different spectrum, but they all the variants and all the other respiratory viruses sort of overlap, so it's really impossible to tell them apart. And as we're seeing this variant really rage across the country and the world right now, there's some confusion. So I'd love to get your perspective on that with the CDC revising the isolation time for infected people from 10 to 5 days. And of course, now people don't need to test out. They can just opt out of staying home if they're symptoms free after, um, again, five days. So with all of that being said, and there is confusion, how do you see these advised guidelines? What's your stance on that? It's always been the case that the 10-day isolation period was one size fits all, and it really didn't reflect when people were contagious for the most part. And so we've been kind of clamoring for some time to decrease the isolation period because we know that many people couldn't do it. 10 days is very disruptive. It was discouraging people from getting tested because they didn't want to isolate for 10 days. And the data from case contact investigation showed that the bulk of transmission was occurring in the first five or so days of, of infection. So I think that the, the CDC, the spirit of this guidance was, was really good. It was about trying to reduce the harm the virus causes, making guidance that people would follow. But it often got muddled, or at least the messaging got muddled because it occurred at a time when there was an Omicron surge, when there was a shortage of home tests, and it got and it seemed to be driven not by science, even though I do believe it was driven by science. And then they got criticism for not including testing. But when they did put testing in, they they kind of put it in such a muddled, wishy-washy way that it actually discourages testing, saying if you want to test, mm-hmm. if you have an access, then you have to isolate for five more days if it's positive. So it, to me, it's it, it's it's more not a scientific issue, but just really uh, bad communication that got picked up by the press and picked up by critics and, and really made, uh, it really looks bad for the CDC. And it makes it very hard to make this, uh, this guidance actionable. But in, in general, what we're trying to do is reduce the harm the virus causes. And if you've got isolation periods that are you know, perfect by the textbook and nobody can follow them, they're not very good. And I think what we want to do is embrace, you know, harm reduction types of philosophies. And if people can isolate for five days, uh, I think that's that's better than them not isolating at all. But we have to come to a sustainable approach to this because even if these infections are mild, if you have to isolate for 10 days, that's not mild on, on your life and the disruption to your life. But I think it, what it should be really gauged to do is prevent the bulk of transmission, be something that people can actually do and not discourage people from getting tested and not be one size fits all. Yeah. And we had you on the rundown at the end of November when the variant was first discovered. And you said at the time that the virus is becoming more transmissible, but not more deadly. Has anything surprised you about the spreading of this new variant since you last joined us? Not particularly. I think what what we got was more data that sort of supported the early indications we had about its transmissibility and its severity. I think what's interesting about it is that it follows this kind of two-week cycle versus a month-long cycle for other variants, at least based on the data that we've seen in the United Kingdom and South Africa. It will be really interesting to see how well it follows that pattern in the United States, which would mean that we might see see peaks starting in the next couple of days in places like New York City that were hit hard first. Looking ahead at the next inevitable variant, do you think that that one will also be more transmissible but less severe? There's always going to be lots of variants generated. Some of them are not going to take off or go anywhere, so you won't even hear about them. But I think the next dominant variant is likely to be in the pattern of Omicron because what we're seeing is the virus kind of moving towards the way other family members, other coronavirus family members behave, where they reinfect basically at will after a period of time and usually cause mild illness because that's advantageous for transmission. If people are out and about doing things with mild illness, they can infect other people. So I I think that Omicron might be the first step down that path to COVID-19 being like the fifth seasonal coronavirus that we deal with. We'll have to see, but I mean, it it certainly looks like that. And I don't think that you're going to see 
the the virus, the, a variant become dominant that is more deadly. Um, I think that's something that doesn't make sense for it from an evolutionary perspective. I mean, it would be a, an unlikely possibility. I think what we're seeing is more transmissibility, more immune evasion. That's what evolution would favor. If future variants continue to weaken, are we likely to need more boosters in the future? Or could a vaccine once a year really be enough to protect ourselves? It's unclear how that that's all going to play out because it comes back to what the goals may be with COVID-19 control. Are we trying to prevent serious illness, hospitalization, and death? Or are we trying to block all infections? Because if we're trying to prevent serious disease, hospitalization, and death, and, and I think that's the right goal, our current vaccines are holding up really, really well uh, at that, even without a booster in most people, uh, th that they're, they're spared from severe consequences. And I think, but I think if we're going to be trying to block all infections, I think an update of the vaccine probably makes the most sense because we're still targeting the Wuhan strain of the virus and we're several variants down the line. Whether or not that has to be annual or, or what frequency, I think that's too early. It's too early to say that. We don't have enough data to be able to say that for sure. And also there is the prospect of universal coronavirus vaccines that have made it through phase one clinical trials and are, are, are moving along sort of outside of the headlines, but they're there. And that might be what we eventually see as a more universal type coronavirus vaccine that covers you know, all variants, as well as maybe even picks up some of the other coronaviruses that cause common colds. Dr. A. Mishadalja, thanks as always for your time. Thanks. From the Fox News Podcasts Network, subscribe and listen to the Trey Gowdy Podcast. Former federal prosecutor and four-term U.S. congressman from South Carolina brings you a one-of-a-kind podcast. Subscribe and listen now by going to foxnewspodcasts.com. And now, some good news with Tanya J. Powers. For the last 224 years, a man has been the commanding officer for the oldest commissioned warship in the world that's still afloat. As of January 21st, that streak will be broken. The Navy says that Commander Billy J. Farrell will take over that day, becoming the first female commanding officer of the USS Constitution. The Constitution was nicknamed Old Ironsides for its reputation of cannonballs bouncing off its wooden hull during the War of 1812. It also defended parts of the ocean around the U.S. from 1797 to 1855 and destroyed or captured at least 33 enemy ships. It's currently stationed in Boston's Charlestown Navy Yard, and women now make up more than a third of the 80-person crew. CBS Boston reports that the current commanding officer of the Constitution, John Benda, said in a statement that the historic barrier is, quote, long overdue to be broken and that he couldn't think of a better candidate for the job. Commander Farrell is not the only woman making military history. This week, the USS Abraham Lincoln became the first ever aircraft carrier to be skippered by a woman when it departed San Diego for its scheduled deployment. Stars and Stripes reports that Captain Amy Bauernschmidt assumed command of the vessel in August. She graduated from the Naval Academy in 1994, the first graduating class in which women were allowed to serve aboard combatant ships and aircraft. Captain Bauernschmidt also earned a master's at the Naval War College, was designated a naval aviator in 1996, and has 3,000 flight hours and numerous commendations. Tanya J. Powers, Fox News. It's time for your Fox News commentary. Janice Dean. What's on your mind? It's been almost two years since the deaths of my in-laws, Mickey and Dee Newman, who contracted COVID-19 in their separate elder care facilities in New York City. Our families were never notified of Governor Andrew Cuomo's mandate to send over 9,000 COVID-positive patients into New York nursing homes, and we still don't know why he decided to do it. There were other facilities provided by the federal government he could have used, like the USS Comfort Ship and the Javits Center, that went virtually empty without any COVID patients. Instead, the governor's health department decided to put the sickest people into the places where our most vulnerable resided. Since May of 2020, myself and thousands of families have demanded answers and accountability into why those deadly decisions were made. But instead of addressing why this tragedy happened on his watch, Cuomo did everything he could 
to cover it up. And despite the disgraced governor's resignation in August, it appears that little by little, those in power are helping him get away with his corruptive, criminal behavior. On Monday, Cuomo's team announced that the Manhattan District Attorney's Office were dropping their nursing home probe. According to the New York Post, the investigation under ex-DA Cyrus Vance Jr. was quashed last Thursday, right before the new DA, Alvin Bragg, was sworn in. How convenient and how telling. Many of us are disturbed and angered by this news, especially since this now seems like a deal was made before Vance left office and hours before the new DA moved in. Peter Arbini, a fierce advocate whose father contracted COVID in a Brooklyn nursing home and died in the spring of last year, says that data manipulation, false public DOH reports, the false reporting of the death toll, and the false testimony given to the Senate and the Assembly are a violation of law and public trust because they were driven by personal profit and gain. This cannot be overlooked. The nursing home tragedy is not the only thing that Cuomo and his team are trying to get away with. Several of the charges of abusive behavior towards women in his office are also quietly going away. The Albany, Westchester, and Nassau County DAs dropped their charges into Cuomo's despicable behavior despite, quote, credible and deeply troubling allegations. Lindsay Boylan, a former aide to Cuomo and the first woman to bravely speak out about his sexual harassment towards her, says that all these various dropped charges are about fear. Fear of a man with money and without scruples and fear tainting by continued focus on abuse of power. My friend and fellow advocate, New York State Assemblyman Ron Kim, chairman of the Assembly Aging Committee, is still optimistic that the other ongoing probes by the FBI, the DOJ, and the AG are more serious and that justice will eventually prevail. According to the New York Post, the Fed's probe is still examining the Cuomo administration's actions relating to the nursing home deaths, and the FBI is still looking into Cuomo's 5.1 advance for his book, American Crisis, Leadership Lessons from the COVID-19 Pandemic, which was negotiated and published while he was being accused of covering up the total nursing home death toll. And just because Cuomo is no longer in power doesn't mean the rest of us are done with trying to hold him accountable or call out his continued corruption. Because although our loved ones can never defend themselves, it's up to us to keep using our voices for justice on their behalf. Janice Dean, Fox News. You've been listening to the Fox News Rundown. Rundown. Stay up to date by subscribing to this podcast at foxnewspodcasts.com. And for up-to-the-minute news, go to foxnews.com. Jason in the House, the Jason Chaffetz Podcast. Dive deeper than the headlines and the party lines as I take on American life, politics, and entertainment. Subscribe now on foxnewspodcasts.com or wherever you download podcasts. Love Fox News? Click the subscribe button to get more of the news and opinion you trust. And click the Fox News Rundown playlist for the latest episodes.